This is the Friday, February 24, 2017 version of the Market Plus segment. Joining us now is Mark Gold. Mark, good to have you here. Nice to be here, Paul. So in all of these crazy times that you travel, I suppose we should address the elephant in the room or the non-elephant with me. Uh, you travel quite a bit for your job going to these meetings. I've asked you in the MTM uh, podcast about your travels. What's your mm. best travel tale since Mike is stuck where he was uh, at today. What's been the worst? I know you had one. Uh, you've had some in, in North Dakota and Nebraska you've talked about. Well, I think the worst was one in North Dakota. I was in Fargo. I had to go to Buffalo and then Arthur. And got to Buffalo okay, and then was driving to Arthur, and a whiteout blizzard hit. And it was the first time I'd actually driven a car off a road. There was a curve in the road. I didn't couldn't see the curve. Went straight ahead, went right into a ditch. The good news was... When I hit the cell phone, the signal went through, and we told the bank where we were. And they said, oh, we know exactly where you're at. We'll come get you. <laughs> they hooked up a rope to a truck and pulled me out, and it was fine. But that was a pretty nasty trip. Well, and uh, that's, that's just part of the job that you do and, and you're, when you're speaking in the middle of the winter. So Mike will be back next week. But Mike, if he was here, he would ask you about the cotton market. I mean, we had a rally in that uh, prior to this week, and then cotton... Uh, still just not improving like it had been. What's going on there? Yeah, we were up a penny, I think, for the week in, in cotton. Uh, that, despite some higher acres, it looks like. We were expecting a shift out of cotton into beans, so that was a little bit uh, surprising. But the market held it pretty well. Uh, we really need a close over 80 cents in the nearby cotton to really confirm that something's going on there. But... Uh, We'll see how these acres, I'm still skeptical about the acres. You think and there's less acres in Less cotton? acres, yeah. If we, if we do lose, lose those acres, then I think we've got a story in the cotton market. And again, you know, past March 31st, we're going to shift from the acreage ideas to the weather ideas. And that's going to be what's really going to dominate these markets. Especially if we continue the warm pattern and the 100s in Texas, that, like you were talking about on the show tonight. You know, even in Chicago, we haven't had one inch of, sh of snow in Chicago since the first week in December, which is unheard of. There were guys, I've never seen this in February, on paddle boards in Lake Michigan. I mean, it's, it's really incredible. We were 70 degrees in Chicago in the middle of February. Now, people want to know, is there any correlation between this warm a temperature in February and a summer drought? And we really haven't seen any definitive answers of that. But if I had a guess... And it's strictly a guess. Could we be looking at a warmer, hotter sp summer this year and maybe a drop potential? I believe these weather, the weather patterns are setting up where it could be an interesting summer in terms of heat. So something to keep on uh, an eye on in many of the markets. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the other thing that we were watching for the markets this week was the USDA outlook. Uh, Tim, a uh, $6 wheat guy in Crookston, Minnesota. Hello, Tim. Uh, Tim wants to know, Historically, are these outlook on planting projections close to the actual planted acres? So he's wanting to know what's their track record. Boy, I don't know. I don't, I've never done a correlation on those. Uh, I think people kind of take them with a grain of salt because from year to year, and look at the shift we've had in corn and soybean acres over the last couple of years. I don't think that's easy to predict, and that's a function of price and what's price going to do two and three years out if anybody knew. Uh, you know, they'd be long retired. But the fact of the matter is, I think where th these reports are valuable is in looking at trends more than anything else. And certainly the report is showing less corn, more beans, and I think that makes some sense. But for years, I've heard folks sit out here and say, we've got to plant more beans. We just can't keep planting corn. But this yeah. is one of the years we've actually seen hard evidence, as hard of evidence as it can be at this point in the game in late February. Yeah, and... Is there going to be a 4 million acre shift out of corn into beans? I think when it's all said and done, it'll be at least four out of corn, some out of wheat, some out of cotton, and that'll get us enough beans if we have the weather. But keep in mind, the bigger these acreage numbers and the projections get, a 10% drop off of yield makes a huge difference now. So if there is a weather implication, even though we've got 420 million carryout, you can lose that very quickly with these kind of acreage numbers. All right, all right. Jay and Paulina is our next question. At market to market is how you find us on the uh, on the Twitter sphere. Uh, he's wanting to know what's your prediction for when the summer slump will hit the corn and soybean market. So, 
Depends on the weather, I would imagine, is, is one qualifier in that. But when you get into that summer months. Some of the best droughts we've seen have really started on June 1st. And so between now and June 1st, knowing that we've got essentially enough acres and enough production uh, and plenty of carry out out here, and the funds now long corn, they're now still long beans and oil and meal. Uh, could that push us into a slump between now and perhaps the uh, 1st of June? It's certainly possible. I don't see the slump June, July, and August as we've seen in other years, particularly if we have any kind of weather issues out here. Uh, if we did have that kind of a summer slump, it would be really a tough period in American agriculture. Uh, it means we're gonna have plenty of acres, big enough production, and possibly significantly lower prices. But let's hope that whatever lows we make, hopefully between now and you know April 15th or so, will be the lows and we can turn higher after that. A lot of times soybeans and meal go together in a week. Uh, this week, not really the same, meal off $8. Um, you mentioned meal in your previous comments. Those fa a lot of times it's the same factors on those two commodities, but what was different this week to send meal in the direction well, it went? I think part of it's the DDG issue in China. Are they gonna take all this meal? And uh, I think that was part of it. There's been plenty of stories around about lysine as a replacement uh, for meal in terms of adding it to uh, other feed sources and using a lot less meal out here. I think that's something we've got to consider out here. Um, again, the meal has gotten a lot higher, like the soybeans did, relative to supply and demand issues. And you know, are the supply and demand issues as critical as they've been? Well, with the advent of funds and long-only funds and hedge funds and all this outside money that's in the market that just want to push and put money somewhere, Fundamentals can sometimes take a backseat to what's happening in the real money world. And that's what we see in these technicals leading the fundamentals so many times. Um, where do we go from here on the meal market? I think is the beans will have a tendency because the funds are so long to maybe come out of these positions. I think there could be some pressure in the meal market. And you think they'll maybe move closer to, they'll, they'll go back to being in concert with one another and not separate? Well, At least th this week was maybe an anomaly. Well, you know, meal was down eight bucks and beans were down, I think, 15, 16 cents. Yeah. Uh, that's about right, as long as the oil was about steady on the week, which okay. I think was maybe down just a little bit. Okay. But uh, the fact of the matter is, I think both beans and meal are overpriced relative to the world fundamentals, but if the funds want it, it's not gonna make a difference. All right, you mentioned just a tiny little bit there, uh, DDGs and China and tariffs. Roger uh, Cooper, uh, tweeted at us a couple of questions. So, Roger, we're going to put a couple of your questions together here. Um, he was asking about livestock production and exports and tariffs and things like that. So, politically speaking now, Mr. Gold, uh, do we see any of our U.S. products, whether it's, uh, you know, you can see there's Roger's question, but do you see uh, tariffs coming on any of our corn, soybean, livestock, you know, the meats? Oh, boy. If I could get into the head of the president, I could probably give you a better answer to that. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I think anybody that tries is just foolhardy. But what I would say is that uh, NAFTA has done a good job of taking tariffs off, which certainly saw benefits to American farmers in terms of export into Canada and to Mexico. Uh, there are some tariffs left going into uh, China Tariffs are obviously not helpful in export markets when we try to build markets. What the president's gonna do with it is anybody's guess. Um, well, you know, there's so many scenarios that could play out, it'd be foolhardy to even try to guess, but. How soon do you think it'll be before we have an idea? Do you think it's gonna take him six months in office before we get a sense better on trade policies? I mean, I don't know if a, a USDA chief is, is gonna matter. I mean. The, 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 the former USDA chief endorsed the current one. There doesn't seem to be any reason to not confirm uh, Sonny Perdue. Yeah. So you don't have that wildness uh, yeah. impact. And I think, that, I think Sonny Perdue is a good choice for the, for the job. Uh, I think he brings a certain stability into the agricultural markets. I think 
if the president decides to look at some things, I think Sonny Perdue is going to be the first guy to knock on his door and say, wait a minute, these are the guys that elected you. Take it easy here. Right. And despite, you know, maybe wanting to go off and do something a little uh, impetuous, uh, maybe there's, there's a calming factor out there. So I'm still hopeful that the president understands how he got into office, who put him into office, and rural America has been a huge part of that, and I don't believe he's going to turn his back on rural America. It's a common theme we've heard a number of times sitting I'm in the sure. chair. So, Mark, before I let you go, i got to ask you one of our commodity questions of the week. It's the one that we do for our education folks uh, as they try to learn more about the markets. The question this week is, what is being range-bound? Well, I think it's, it's a good question. Uh, you know, so often many of us in the business assume that the public knows all the jargon that we're tossing around that we've been doing for, you know, 40, 50 years. 43 years. years. Uh, so... We, we forget that not everybody, and I get questions from my emails all the time. Mark, what did you mean by this or that or the other thing? Uh, what does range bound mean? It means a market that's range bound on a chart pattern. So, for example, if uh, soybeans keep getting up to 1060, backing off to 990, back up to 1060, back down to 990, and we just get in that range and we can't seem to break out of it one way or another, that's a market that's range bound. Now, corn have been range-bound and couldn't get through 370. We got through it for a few days, and then we went right back into the range again. So even though you take out those ranges, it's not necessarily 100% uh, positive that we're going to continue to go in that direction. But range-bound is when you're in that band of prices and you can't seem to break out of it, and you've hit the support and resistance levels many times over the course of months. You'll have to give us some of those other questions that you get, and we'll put them in here as well. Uh, we'll do that. All right. Mark Gold, thank you so very much. Good to have you back. Thanks very much. We'll see you in a few weeks. Uh, join us again next week, though, when Sue Martin will be in his chair, and we'll be with Mike here at the Market to Market table, and they will explore how carnivores process cancer news about some of their favorite dietary staples. And just a reminder, uh, if you find value in our work, please consider clicking the Donate Now button that you can find on our website. So until then... Thanks for watching or listening. I'm Paul Yeager. Have a great week.